And so I want to just talk a little bit about the way in which one part of <laughs> what we're aiming for, which is a real democracy, will always be an ongoing struggle. That why we'll never achieve a perfect democracy, but the, the thing to do is to keep struggling. And I think it's probably fair to democracy and local an important part of the work they're doing. But I think it's probably also fair to say not the primary. Probably most people in this room think of different kinds of social justice goals as the primary objective. I'm not going to really talk about social justice. I'm going to talk about democracy. They're linked, to be sure, but they're not exactly the same thing. And so I want to uh, spend the next 15 or minute, 20 minutes talking about three different aspects of struggling and fighting to improve the quality of democracy. And the, the first thing I'll kind of go over is some remarks about what good democracy is and how we measure whether or not a community is democratic or how good its democracy is. The second thing is a, a framework for thinking about tool, for thinking about where that which we want to work on improving democracy. And the third thing that I want to talk about, or the third kind of tool or framework that I want to present for and hopefully it'll be useful, is a way about think, thinking about alternative alternatives that might improve the quality, about what it means for a situation or the way some set of people or community makes decisions, whether or not that's democratic or how democratic it is. And I want to say that there are at least five kind of questions you should ask yourself when you're asking whether your group or your community or your country or even international decisions are democratic or not. And the first uh, one is the most important, and it's the principle of inclusion. And one of the most basic democratic impulses, I think, what we mean when we say that a decision is democratic or not, is we ask ourselves, are the people who are affected by a decision accorded some influence, some voice in making that decision? And if those people are included, then it's more democratic than if they're not included. And so when you come to a question of environmental justice, one of the problems is the people in that affected community do not exercise influence over the way some of those decisions are made, where a hazardous waste facility gets cited, et cetera. Let's have $100 billion. <laughs> or, or, or where the $100 billion goes, or the, the trillion dollars, I guess, $800 billion. How about the money you print? Yeah. <laughs> the second principle is, is equal and effective consideration. It's not enough just for a set of people to be included. They have to be, their interests, their values, what they want, their needs, have to be considered as equal. And I'm going to go a little quick, bit quickly here. And the, the third question you got to ask yourself is, are the people who are affected, do they have opportunities to participate in that decision? Do they have effective opportunities to participate in that de decision equally? And the fourth and fifth, the, the first three, I think, are, are pretty natural. Um, the fourth and fifth are a little bit different. And the fourth one is, even if you get the first three, a decision-making process, we all know, can generate a lot more conflict than there needs to be. So a better democratic process, compared to a less good one, is one in which the conflict is constructively managed. There will always be conflict, and that's an important and appropriate thing. But there are ways to manage that conflict constructively to achieve that third point of the compass of collaboration and cooperation better and worse. And then finally, this one may be a little bit counterintuitive. Um, I think of participation, asking people to come out to meetings, to do stuff, to show up, is asking a lot from them. And you shouldn't ask people to participate more than is important for them to secure their needs or goods like social justice. And if, if there are, I think, two different ways of doing things, both of which deliver justice in a fairly democratic way, and they're both the same on that dimension, you should pick the one that actually requires people to participate less, not more, because people have a lot to do, a lot of other things to do. OK, so that's the, and we can talk about whether or not you agree with that or whether that one should go um, later on. So that's, that's the first kind of account there of how we tell, how we should reckon, how we should measure whether or not a community, an organization, a state, the nation is democratically governed or not. Now the, the next kind of framework I want to present kind of takes you back to your second grade civics class. Um, 
about what the structure, the kind of structure of democratic governance that we all live in is, and then offers a little bit of diagnosis about when it breaks down, when our democracy is less good, less democratic than it should be. So if you remember back to your second grade civics class, this is how our democracy is supposed to work at all levels, at the national level, at the state level, at the level of towns and cities, right? And the idea, very simply, is people have interests. They want good schools. They want um, a clean, sustainable environment, et cetera. They form some preferences over what kinds of politicians, Barack Obama, John McCain, whoever, will best achieve those things. They get to vote. They go to the ballot box. They vote for who they think will best achieve those things. They get elected. The elected official makes some policies, hands that off to some agencies, the federal bureaucracy, um, city agencies, et cetera. And then hopefully those agencies will do some stuff that help people out, that satisfy their interests. Now everybody in this room knows that this picture here, this second grade civics ideal, breaks down all the time at lots of different points. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here doing the work that you're doing, right? And so what I'm trying to offer uh, here in this little piece is a way of thinking about exactly how it breaks down. Because by understanding how it breaks down or when it breaks down, uh, you make choices about what sorts of constructive alternatives to create. And I want to say there are at least three important ways in which it breaks down. The first way is that, and we sometimes we don't like to admit this, but I think it's true, that a lot of the times, a lot of people in communities or in the nation as a whole don't really know clearly what they want. They have trouble making trade-offs. They don't want to make trade-offs because those trade-offs are painful trade-offs. So, you know, forget about conflict and power. I'm talking about even within individuals, they don't know what they want. So everybody wants lower taxes and better services. A lot of people want a, a very high rate of growth and environmental protection and a, a sustainable environment at the same time without trading it off. A lot of people want affordable housing in, in high value neighborhoods. They kind of espouse that value, but they don't want their property values even to be sacrificed a little bit. And so even within individuals, particular individuals, oftentimes we're confused because we haven't done the hard work in figuring out exactly what we really want and how to trade it off, right? And if we haven't done that hard work, and if people in a community or an organization or the nation as a whole haven't done that hard work, then the whole rest of our democratic chain isn't worth very much. Um, in, when I was much younger, I used to do a little engineering. And there's a saying in engineering, garbage in, garbage out. And if the whole machinery of democracy is supposed to take what people want and turn that into reality, but what people, if what people want doesn't really make a lot of sense, then garbage in, garbage out. Oftentimes, we don't like to admit, of course, that people don't really know what they want because you know, one of our slogans is power to the people, and that presumes that people know what they want um, with some clarity. But it's often not true. The second point, and this is one that uh, I won't spend a lot of time on because a lot of people here are very familiar with this. This is the no part of the compass here. And a second part of the, the uh, democratic process or the representative process in which it can have some problems is low accountability. Once politicians get elected or people get in power, they listen to some people, a few people, a lot more than they listen to other people. And oftentimes, the machinery of elections, because it's open to money and influence and everything else and better organization, actually, ends up not being very accountable to the broad mass of people, ends up serving the interests of only a few. And there's all kinds of versions of this. And I'll talk about a couple of versions in the examples in a moment. And then also a problem that uh, you're all familiar with, I think, because uh, you are trying to create constructive solutions in the community, is that even if the whole chain worked up until the very last point, it would often be the case that government, the people we pay to solve our public problems, even with the best of will, cannot solve those problems by themselves. 